diversity and inclusion work was always just D and I, and we've now included the E because diversity cannot happen without equity. Welcome to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, a show about adoption, foster care, advocacy, and becoming the best caregiver possible. Pull up a chair. We're glad you've joined us. Here are your hosts, Mike and Kristen Berry. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Honestly Adoption Podcast. You are joining us for Season 23, Episode 194. Actually, this is the conclusion of Season 23. And man, let me tell you, we are going out with a bang on this particular season. We are so excited to welcome our special guest, Rachel Lauren, to the show. You're going to learn all about her and the amazing work she does here in just a few moments. Rachel is an advocate. She is a voice. She is an agent of change. And we loved speaking with her and getting to know her. Before we get to that, I need to tell you, we're down to the wire when it comes to Insight One Day Training tickets. If you guys are new to the show and this is the first time you're hearing about Insight One Day, Insight One Day Training is a one day event happening next month, just actually uh, actually happening this month in just a couple of weeks on October 19th. And we are diving deep into brain science behind trauma and behavior, disrupted attachment, and how to help your children heal. We're excited to welcome our good friends, Jessica Sinarski, who is a highly sought after therapist. Dr. Laura Anderson will also be joining us. She is a world-renowned child psychologist. And guys, listen, they are, we are going to dive deep into this topic. And really, this virtual event is all about helping you become the best parent and caregiver possible, best professional possible. You can even get training credit hours, continuing education credit hours. But I got to tell you, here's the warning. We are almost out of tickets. We've almost filled up this entire virtual event. So don't miss your chance to grab your spot. Jump over to honestlyadoption.com forward slash one day, or you can click the link in the show notes and grab your ticket while they still last. You won't want to miss this online event happening in just a couple of weeks. Now, let's jump into this amazing interview with our brand new friend, Rachel Lauren. Rachel, welcome. <laughs> Can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yes. Um, so I'm Rachel Lauren. I'm known as the conscious influencer on social media. Um, I am a mother first, an adoptive mother. Um, I am a Black Life Advocate. I'm a diversity, equity, and inclusion professional, senior director of People and Culture for Dream Corps. Consider myself to be a healer, a lover, um, and a friend. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your family. Um, so I'm divorced and I adopted three children with my ex-husband. We're great friends. Um, we both reside in Texas. I'm originally from the Midwest, from Chicago. Um, so most of my family is there. So it's just me and my three kiddos. That's a, that's a long distance too. Uh-huh. We have family in Texas, <laughs> so we're familiar with that trek there yeah. as well. Yeah, but, by plan. but I, I'm feeling the weather. I am yes. not a fan of the cold and not a fan of snow. So that's what yeah. really, you know, made it great for me. There's a lot going on in Texas right now though. So <laughs> there's there really that. Is. You live in. <laughs> it really is. You I was like, in. do we have 12 hours mm-hmm. for this interview? Cause there's a lot to talk about right, right exactly. now in Texas. Okay. So you have three children. Um, Mm -hmm. you're currently living in Texas. You're an adoptive mom. What Mm -hmm. led you to adopt? Um, I honestly believe that it was what I was created to do. It's something that I was always interested in. One of my closest friends is actually adopted that I grew up with. And I, um, you know, used to hear stories from her and just how she felt like grateful and loved and, um, that her life changed right by being adopted. And so it was something I was always interested in. I, thought, okay, I'll conceive and then maybe I'll adopt one child. Um, and it just didn't work out that way. I ended up fostering, fell in love with all seven of the kids that have been in my home, still in contact with um, the ones that I didn't adopt. And, you know, I thought that I would have a piece of me that would feel like I need to do the experience of caring, right? To feel that like motherhood, would it, would it come naturally? 
and it did. And I don't feel like I, I'm missing anything at all. Um, I just remember, you know, growing up, I was always the friend that was the mom. <laughs> I was always the friend that was the nurturer that was taking care of everyone. It's just in me. So that's what led me to it. I love that. I, uh, I feel the same way. So all eight of ours were adopted. Also, we were foster parents for nine years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, as you were, as you were saying, you don't feel like you missed out on anything. I was mm-hmm. thinking about, I just watched my youngest walk to school. Um, and I'm just looking at, at his face in awe. I, I don't even know how else to describe it. He's so adorable and perfect. <laughs> and, and all eight of our kids, I, I think that's a conversation that Mike and I stand back and, and talk about a lot. We could not have made these eight people. They mm-hmm. are just exactly who they're supposed to be. And, and yeah, it has yeah, shifted. Yeah. It's not a sense of missing out. Honestly, Mike and I were super awkward looking kids anyway. So I'm like, you guys dodged a (laughs) bullet there. (laughs) So but I think I I just it it puts us in this position of almost standing back in awe of who Mm -hmm. they are. Um Mm -hmm. and one thing that we've noticed as we've watched them grow is there is a lot less pressure for them to be like us. I never thought that they were going to be, they're just who they are. And yeah, as we're yeah. watching this unfold, uh, one of our sons loves cars and, uh, was telling me all about cars on the way to school today. And I mean, I could not care less about cars. He did not <laughs> get that from me, but listening to him, you know, he knows the safety ratings and he knows, you know, how fast this car goes and how much it costs. And Mm -hmm. I don't even know. So I I love to see all the unique parts of who they are and never for a second, do I think I missed out. I I love that you said that. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, Rachel. Sorry about that. I was just going to say, I, I, I love that. I just love that we've gotten onto this topic. I mean, we have so much uh, that we could mm-hmm. talk about with you, but I, I, I think this is really good for a lot of parents who listen to this show to hear you say that and just to hear the the commentary on this because I think that there are people that you know that get into go that enter into the adoption and foster care journey and mm-hmm. they they have that wonder like in, you know like for me personally I grew up in an all biological family adoption was not part of the storyline mm-hmm. and it was a question I had going into it, you know, and there are people who have come up to us and said, I don't know, I'm thinking about doing this, but could I, I just don't know if I could love a child, a, a, a child that I've adopted the same way I, I love a child that's, that's biological. And my, my response is always, you can, and you will, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, if your heart is open to, if your heart, if you're, you just have an open heart, you know, you're going to, it doesn't matter how the, the child came into your family. Um, you have the capacity to love. So I I just, I love that we're touching on this in this interview. Yeah. I mean, I think family has much more to do with heart than it does blood. There's a lot of people that are bio that, that, that don't have the same story. (laughs) Right. So um, I, I genuinely believe that. And it's amazing how, when I look at my children, um, how well they fit me. (laughs) So to your Mm. point, um, you know, what you were saying earlier, it's even my youngest daughter, people will be like, Oh, you look like her. Like she looks just like Mm. you. (laughs) And and has, they have no idea that she's adopted. Um, all three of my kids strangely look like they came from my family. So (laughs) it's funny why that actually had people ask me if I'm sure. Oh, but are you sure? sure? And I'm like, gosh, I feel like I would have remembered giving birth to this one, but (laughs) maybe I'm gotten the same question. (laughs) So, (laughs) all right. So I want to move into a little bit, um, just kind of a bigger picture of who you are. And then I, Mm -hmm. I want to talk some more about the foster care system for sure, because (laughs) that's our audience. Um, but you have a quote, uh, on your website, the very first thing that pops up. So I copied this, um, back when I first started trying to find out who you are and Uh it says this, it's on your about you page. Um, it says we are taught to pick a lane and stay in it. Mm -hmm. I don't fit in one lane and I refuse to try. 
I belong in conversations influencing equity in rooms determining the growth of our foster care system, at tables discussing the importance of holistic health, and in arenas fighting for the rights of women. I pick me and outside of society's box. Mm. I'm going to say that resonated with me for sure. And I think Mike too, because this has been um, a journey for us as well that we uh, answer or don't answer, um, see a lot of private messages and DMs and emails come through saying, well, you're not who I thought you were. Um, You need to get in your lane. Isn't this They're about trying to put us in a box? Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. We, we don't I bend. saw you speak once and I'm so disappointed in you. Um, but I'm not just <laughs> like people own us. Um, mm-hmm. like we need to just pick one thing. And I right. love that you address that right there at the beginning. So what are a few things that you would yeah. say define you as of today? Yeah, um, I'm. Uh, this is the first interview that anyone has actually gone to my website and read that quote. So it's very oh. exciting that you found that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that you know throughout life I've I've dibbled and dabbled in different things. Um, even my career, right? Like it, I didn't start in diversity, equity, inclusion. I didn't start in HR. Um, I actually started in food and beverage. I worked in sales. Um, I was always interested in different causes, right? Um, Whether it be for women's rights or for foster care or for black life. Um, And so I would feel like I needed to pick a lane because how do you become successful in all things? That's how, that's what I told myself. What actually led me to DEI work was I felt like all of the things that I'm interested in add up to that. (laughs) It's, it's, you know, it's people. Um, It's, communities that are not seen, right? It's talking to individuals that um, come from different backgrounds and have different ways of thinking, uh, maybe even different ways of learning. So it just, for me was like, yeah, this is who I am because I I don't fit in a box. And I do think that society tries to place you in one. Um, But I can be fiercely a woman and still a nurturer and still take care of my house and still believe in women's rights and and women's power. Right. Um, I just think that there's a both and so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, gosh, this is, uh, I'm like driving right now as we're recording this, but I'm, I I'm smiling ear to ear. The people that just passed me have to think like, what is going on with that guy? Right. (laughs) But um, you know, I love it because I, you know, one of the transformation journeys that I, I went on personally, not that long ago was this realization that, um, I staying silent doesn't change anything. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I think that sometimes we, we, we get into these modes of thinking like, well, I have so much to say about this particular issue, you know, a social, Mm -hmm. a justice issue, but what am, who, who am I? what can I do? Right. And we have these strong beliefs and I had that for so long. And, you know, when in May of 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, it snapped something in me. Mm -hmm. And I just woke up and said, you know what? Silence is no good. Silence is silence. Doesn't do anybody any good. And whatever it is that I can do, I'm, I want to, I want to step in to this space and be a voice, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and help in any way I can. And I, I think there's a lot of people that, that listen to this show, a lot of people in the world that think, you know, who am I? What can I do? Uh, how can I speak up? Uh, how can I make, make change? Um, what, what would you say to that person that's just, you know, struggling with that, but, but has the heart and the passion to say, I, I, need, to, I need to do something. I need to, to help in any way I can. I think the the first answer would be identify where your privilege is. Um, Mm. Everyone has privilege, right? In different areas. Um, Unfortunately, the country that we live in has been built on um, a lot of systemic racism, right? And so because of that, we as Black people are at a disadvantage. And so I think the first most obvious privilege is white privilege. But um, there are other privileges, right? Educational privilege. Um, 
depending on where you grew up, there are privileges that, that come with that. There's privilege in um, being heterosex, heterosexual, excuse me. So it's identifying where you have privilege and then how you can use that privilege to help individuals that don't have that, that don't have access, that don't um, you know, have those backgrounds and those things that they can use. And I think allyship is something that one, you do when no one else is looking and you do whether you get the recognition for it or not, right? Like you show yeah. up, you stand up, you speak up and it's not because I'm sitting next to you. It's actually right. when I'm not in the room that you do it. That's an ally. Yeah, right. yeah. So I think we can transition um, into the foster or transition kind of narrow mm -hmm. down a little bit into the foster care system because when we're talking about um, areas where people are being harmed for, for lack mm -hmm. of a better phrase, um, where the foster care system, it pops up. Um, yeah. the foster care system is, um, in many ways overburdened and uneducated, um, steeped in systemic racism as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, as former foster parents, I see that reform needs to happen within the mm -hmm. foster care system. Yeah. Um, and you're passionate about it as well. If you could make a change or changes in the foster care system, where would you begin? Well, I think one of the things that I recognize is, you know, there are some great caseworkers that are out there. There are some not so great ones as well. Um, I think the process of identifying who gets to have that responsibility should be a little bit more lengthy. Um, but I also think that the individuals that are in those roles don't get the credit that they deserve. They don't get the financial backing that they should get. Um, they're not paid well, right? Like it's, it's concerning to me that we pay well for so many positions, but this, something that's so important, right? To our children, um, we don't. And yeah. so I think that that's, that's a great start. Um, I also think that, you know, reunification is always the goal. And I know, you know, this as a foster parent, that's not always easy to hear, to believe right. in, um, especially when you're in the situation, you know, what's happened to the child, um, you've fallen in love with the child. Um, I think that there should be more conversation around that, more training around that. Um, more support even for foster parents, because just like social workers, foster parents are taking on responsibility as well. And I think that a lot of times um, the parents are not treated that great. Um, they're not prepared, right, uh, properly for how to handle um, when a child bleeds. <laughs> um, and I think that our voices matter. And there are a lot of cases, even that I was involved in, that we weren't listened to at all. And so there's got to be some sort of uh, common ground that happens on all parts, right? The case. So. Well, I, I really agree. And I think um, so many times within the foster care system, the foster parent is the connector between mm -hmm. all uh, the caseworker, the biological family, the child, the doctor, the occupational therapist. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't have any training for that. And if you don't have someone who teaches you how to do that, um, how do you know what to do with all the information you have? Um, and how can you um, separate your feelings is not the right word. How can you use your feelings about the situation to advocate well? And I would mm -hmm. say um, our very first foster placement uh, was uh, my friend's children. And so that shifted our perspective in that we weren't trying to take our friend's kids. We were just trying to, you know, bide the time just yeah. until things could be better. That put us in a position where looking back on it, I think every foster parent should have an experience like that, where, mm -hmm. um, they want to fight as hard for mom and dad as themselves and the kids. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, we had a wonderful um, caseworker who was also our child's foster mom. So she was on both sides, really taught us how to do that step-by-step. Step. And she modeled that behavior for us, how to get somewhere at the visitation center, how to get someone to listen to you. Um, 
how to stand in the lobby at the Department of Child Services until somebody finally acknowledges your presence and Mm -hmm. how to speak up in court, how to have your documentation ready. Um, Sometimes it's to say something that's really hard. And then sometimes it's to stand up and say, um, these children shouldn't have been removed in the first place. And I've now spent this time getting to know mom and dad. And this is, this is my perspective. Um, we got really lucky in that we just, we had somebody who just ended up, she just liked us. I don't know. She was just sweet and, and said, Oh, here's the part where you tell the judge what you think. And she just never waited. She was like, okay, go. Um, and she was wonderful. And that put us in a different position, but I don't know that foster parents even know that they can fight for the best interest of the child and of the family. Um, and, and that's not always reunification. We know that too, uh, but reunification first and then permanency. The goal, yeah. yeah. You know, the, something way. else that I would say too is, um, and this is a DEI professional in me speaking, but yeah. when it comes to training, I think that there's a uh, cultural competency that needs to happen training. Um, there's unconscious bias training that needs to happen because there are going to be families that adopt or foster children that don't come from the same ethnic or racial background as they do. And I think that it is unfair to take a child who's already been taken from what they would consider their identity, right? And then bring them into your home and not have any sort of sensitivity or understanding of who they are yes, and what, what, who they are means for their journey in life and in society. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, there's the big things and then there's the small things. Um, there are families that I've helped that, you know, live near me that maybe have adopted black children and I've taught them how to deal with their skin and their hair because it's different. (laughs) Um, so just being able to be prepared in, in those ways, I think that's important too. And I think to be able to look for some of those unconscious biases, Mm -hmm. that's a nice way to put it, maybe blatant racism, um, in everything in the rest of the community. I know that mm-hmm. for a long time, Mike and I would ask ourselves, um, wait, did we just see that happen? Did that, mm-hmm. did something just happen to our child? Was that racist or was that person confused? Um, we're much more likely. It didn't take very long to start calling those things out, to ask questions. Like I see that you've called my child into the office for her uniform. Are you going to go ahead and call this student and this student and this student? Um, you know, are, are just your, your black students getting in trouble for uniform violations or is that going to be your policy across the board? Um, just a, for instance, my kids hate when I call the school, but I'm always like, you know what, babe, you look nothing like me. So we're just going to pretend like you just walk <laughs> past me and pretend like you don't know me. <laughs> I'll just, I'll go talk to the principal. Um, but I, I think, that. you know, even just learning that we need to be looking for those within ourselves um, mm-hmm. and within our communities, uh, mm-hmm. there are ways that hopefully we can prepare. I'd like to see that training for our caseworkers. We know yep. that. Um And I guess this isn't just along racial lines, um, but culture is important. And if children are being removed because um, their culture does not align with what the caseworker thinks is acceptable or appropriate, uh, that just adds another layer of trauma. And there are certain things that people do with and and for their children that are going to be different from whatever the caseworker finds. normal, I, for lack of a better word. Uh, and I think that having that type of training would prevent in a lot of ways, um, caseworkers from walking in and assessing a situation in a way that is, um, inappropriate damaging. Yep. I agree. You mentioned, um, holistic health, and I'd love to know what you mean by that. So what is holistic health and why is it important to you? Yeah. So, um, also something that I was just always interested in. I am predominantly plant-based and with my diet. Um, every now and then I have a little fish, but I'm plant-based majority and I wasn't always, but the, the way that I feel being that, um, the things that I just noticed in my body and my mood and my energy, like all of that is, you know, important to me. Um, I grew up with a mother who was very into, you know, that as well. And, um, natural healing, natural remedies, um, 
always kind of thinking about herbs and, you know, ways that we can heal our body before we get to the medicine, not saying that medicine isn't important, but there are, you know, things that we can do sometimes that we can avoid having to take prescription. (laughs) Um, And so I would, I think because I cook well, um, I always would like play with different spices and like just do different things. And I never realized that that was a gift, but it is. Yeah. Um, and so I, for whatever reason, I'll feel something or someone will tell me, you know, like something that they're going through and I'll say, oh, all right, this is what you need. <laughs> Mix yeah. these things and drink this tea. And, and I don't know, it's just, I guess, a gift. And so it is I, a gift. I talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is a gift. So, um, how are you using your experiences to make a difference? Um, so I would say every day in my career, um, I have the pleasure of working for a nonprofit, um, dream core, it's Van Jones organization. And, um, the different areas that we touch are on criminal justice reform in the system. Um, the economy green for all is, is the department that does that. And then tech, um, and that is trying to get black and Brown individuals into the tech industry. So those are three areas that I've actually always been really interested in and have done work in even prior to working for dream core. And so being able to lead, um, the people that run that organization and contribute to the internal culture and how we show up externally as well as, um, something that's really important to me. So I'd say that. And then most definitely impacting my children, because I believe that they are going to be not only the future, but that they have callings on their lives as well. And so whatever role I play and making sure that they fulfill that, I think is the the biggest gift. That's how I'm showing up. That's exciting. That's such a, what a neat thing to be able to do in your career and in your everyday life. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those things are are so important to us. And I think that that was what attracted us to you as we were just kind of, um, I end up saying this on almost every podcast, lots of people ask to be on our podcast and mm-hmm. we can't do that. Um, there's just not enough time in the world to interview every single person, um, even though every single person has an interesting story. But when we began to read about who you are and what you do, um, you know, for selfish reasons, those are things that are important to me. Um, when yeah. I read about um, criminal justice reform, um, that is a, a big one for us right now as we are, um, again, navigating the criminal justice system with one of our children mm-hmm. um, and how that plays out, um, in terms of, um, mental health, um, advocacy, advocacy for a now, uh, adult child. Um, and so anyway, that, that, that I wasn't going anywhere with that and I'm not going to get emotional here. Um, but you know, anytime I see, uh, that people are, are advocating in that way that are, are moving toward, um, justice in, in any area, um, but particularly in criminal justice, uh, that's something that's really important to us. And we have now been navigating the criminal justice system for a long time as a family and not a place that, uh, we ever wanted to get really familiar with, but here we are. So I'm, I'm glad that there are people who are, who are helping. Yeah. I mean, there are so many things, right. That have to happen. Um, it's, it's ironic because I, my father was the first black captain of the state of Illinois police. Um, and so I grew up with law enforcement right. yet find so many issues <laughs> with our system and fight very strongly and openly about, you know, changing that. Um, yes. I, yeah. my, one of my children was born in prison, um, both parents incarcerated and, So outside of what I know about our system and how it affects people that look like me, um, I also feel called and um, I think that it's necessary that that my child grows up and knows that I know that his biological parents were affected and impacted by the system and me adopting him, Mm -hmm. um, you know, makes me want to help with that even more, right? Like I want to be able to tell him that story. So, yeah, Yeah. this is great. I mean, I'm, I'm, my head is spinning. Mm -hmm you know, Rachel, as I listen to you and, um, you know, I, 
that's such a unique perspective um, from the law enforcement side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just, just to have, you said it was your father mm-hmm. who was the first mm-hmm. yeah. black captain. Wow. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, I don't, I don't think I have a question right there. I, I, I just am, I, I, I'm loving listening to your story. Um, and I feel like we need to schedule a follow-up <laughs> interview there's to a, cover some of the other, there's a lot. Extra, We're not you know, even nearly through like the yeah. 500 questions I had written down. <laughs> So yeah. I would love to come back. I love, I, yeah. I love it. There's so much to talk about. I'm like, don't ask that one because we don't have six hours to dig in to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I like that again, that you talked about, um, kind of that both. And, and I think that that's a place that we live in a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Mike and I do personally, mm-hmm. um, you know, both an adoptive parent And someone that believes that um, children are often removed when they should not have been removed. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Both an advocate for a better foster care system and an advocate for tearing it down. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I I see both. I see both a need to um, demolish systems that have existed um, and also a need for some of those systems to exist in a different way. Um, and so, you know, you definitely have your, your foot in both worlds in a lot of ways and, uh, certainly a respect for your father and a need for things to change in our world too. Um, um yeah. when you, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, I actually have another quote from you and, and this is, um, heavy. So I'm going to read it out loud, um, okay. and see where we go here. All right. You said our history in this country is an enormous assortment of trauma. We carry ancestral, relational and civil trauma every single day, like a handbag too heavy to hold, but too delicate to let go of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote that um, in an op-ed that I did um, about Breonna Taylor. Mm. And um, that was that particular quote is really how I felt being a black woman in this country, how I still feel being a black woman in this country. Um, I think that, (laughs) you know, society wants us to believe that we're not seen, um, that we're not valuable. Um, And, you know, on the heels of Breonna Taylor's murder, I felt like, you know, that was something that needed to be said. we carry ancestral trauma. Um, We as black women from the beginning of our time in this country were not only mistreated, but we were looked to be um, the person that kept it all together. Mm -hmm. We were raising Mm -hmm. children that were ours and not ours, (laughs) Mm -hmm. feeding children that were ours and not ours. Um, And so I just think that, you know, there's ancestral healing that hasn't happened and yet we're still living in today yeah. right now um in this treatment right so yeah. yeah that was a heavy that was a heavy piece but i still stand by that and i, I still mm. feel that yeah so good so good and you know it I, I i hope people grasp the gravity of what you what you just shared because mm-hmm. i think that unfortunately what i've seen in white america is that that's that's just and i think you said it a, a moment ago it's, it's Mm -hmm. just, it's overlooked and it's dis it's, it's discredited and it's downplayed. Mm -hmm. And frankly, that is, that is frustrating. Um, and it's maddening. And I hope that our listeners are grasping the gravity of what you just said and the reality of what you just said. Um, because that is, because it's reality and, um, you know, it, the, the, the perspective needs to change. Um, the perspective from white people that needs to change. Mm -hmm. Um, because the reality of what you just said is that, you know, there is, there is for, since the beginning of, of, uh, history that has been discredited and downplayed. And yeah, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm grateful that you, you shared that and that we shared this quote on, on the show, because I, we have such a diverse audience and, 
you know, I, I want, I want people to grasp that gravity. <laughs> that's, that's all I can say about that. You know? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. When you envision a world for your children, what would you like to see? <sighs> wow. Um, I definitely would like to see reform in all of the systems that we just talked about. Right. I don't think that um, a change of life for my children could be actualized without that. Um, because I, the thing is systemic racism runs so deep, right? Like we talk about the major systems, criminal justice system, foster care system, healthcare. Um, but I see it professionally every day. Right. So again, as a black woman, it, who has been in corporate America, who's now in the nonprofit space, I know that there are so many of us that are overeducated, underpaid, undervalued. Um, and so there are real changes that have to happen. Um, diversity and inclusion work, it was always just D and I, and we've now included the E. And I think that that should have always been there because equity cannot, well, diversity cannot happen without equity. Like we've got to have the conversation first about the fact that everyone is not on the same playing field. We didn't start from the same place and we don't have the same access. And so how do we fix that so that now we can actually have diversity and inclusion and belonging? Um, and so those are the things that I want to see change for them. And I want, I want my daughters to grow up in a world where they understand that they are valuable, that they matter. Um, and that they have every right to get the things that they desire, just like everyone else does. And I want to grow up. I want my children to grow up in a world um, where I am not afraid of what will happen if my son gets pulled over. Um, and that he understands also, right, that he is valuable yeah. and that his life is yeah. important and he can yeah. also um, achieve and receive the things that he wants. And I think, you know, even outside of them just being black children. Um, they are adopted children. So I want them to understand that how they began in this world, um, again, does not separate them from um, being, in my eyes, perfect children. <laughs> right? Yes, like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So. Exactly. I, I think the, yeah. the world, first of all, your children deserve that and you deserve mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, totally, um, yeah. I just want the world to see my kids the way that I see them. So that mm -hmm. all of them, you know, so mm -hmm. that they can uh, walk through this world, not looking over their shoulder and wondering if they're safe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Rachel, we have a, a, a pretty, a pretty uh, devoted uh, and passionate mm -hmm. audience with this podcast. And I think a lot of people, if I could speak for them uh, right now, would they have the what I call the put me in coach mentality, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I'm ready, you know, let's mm -hmm. do this. And, you know, back to what we were talking about a moment ago about reform in the foster care mm -hmm. system and, and um, you know, achieving uh, throttling diversity, you know, equity and inclusion, you know, for the person that's thinking, I'm ready, tell me, tell me what I can do. Tell me, you know, where to start with this, uh, you know, that put me in coach. Yeah. So what would you say to that person who's asking like, okay, I totally agree with you and I'm ready to go. Yeah, I think um, with the foster care system specifically, um, if for individuals that are foster parents, I would highly encourage them to go through the training that we talked about on their own. So sure, it might not be an yeah. offering of an agency. It might not be state mandated, but that doesn't mean that you can't educate yourself. And there are a lot of resources and organizations that can assist with that. Mine is one, diversified, www.diversifiednow.org. Yeah. <laughs> um, but even outside of, you know, outside of that for individuals that might not be, um, working within the system right now, as you know, CASA, um, being able to volunteer mm -hmm. and be a court appointed, uh, advocate for children is something that I think is extremely needed and valuable. Um, contacting different agencies that are in your area and seeing what it is that they need and how you can even just assist them and the families that mm -hmm. are um, a part of their agency is, is something else that, you know, I think could, you could do. Um, there are so many organizations that are supporting families. One of my favorite is Foster Village, which is in Texas. They um, have a group of mothers that have basically put together lots of different donations from car seats to, to high chairs to clothes 
Um, and they have um, storage spaces where they keep all of this. And when someone gets a, a new placement, they can literally fill out a form. And within 24 hours, they will have the things that they need on their doorstep. Mm. Um, Wow. So organizations like that, I mean, it's hard, you know, this, it's hard to know what children are going to come into your home. So I know people get excited when they get licensed and want to prepare, but you don't know Mm -hmm. what what they're going to come with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, organizations like that, where you can say, I need a high chair, I need a car seat and I need it in 24 hours. Um, I think it's amazing. Or less. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's like they're coming in the next hour. Yeah. And you're like, and it's the middle of the night. So, right. um, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, uh, practical action steps. I, I think that's, that's highly valuable. Um, and I think people get overwhelmed, um, mm-hmm. because they think, okay, well then I have to do this and do this, this, but you're, what you just shared was very practical. Um, uh, mm-hmm. it's something that you can pick up the phone or, or log into your computer and do right now. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So before we ask our last question, where okay. can our listeners connect with you? And for our listeners, all of this will be in the show notes. So don't write while you're driving. If you're listening to this in your car, um, all of this will be in the show notes, but where can our listeners connect with you and with your work? Um, so the only Rachel.com is my website. Um, and I have, um, my business is linked on that website. So if you just go to that, you can see both websites. Um, my Instagram is, I guess my social media platform of choice. So at the only Rachel is my handle there. You can actually type that in, um, on other platforms too. I think Facebook and like LinkedIn, you can type that in and I'll come up. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Great. So on a less heavy subject, um, the Barry family has been playing a long running game of would you rather. And so we have two would you rather questions before you go. Okay. Okay. All right. Would you rather be a genius and know everything or be amazed at any activity you tried? Ooh, that's a good one. isn't it? It is a good one. And I, and I'm a Capricorn. So because I'm a Capricorn, I already think I know everything. Exactly. (laughs) So So I would rather be You're in good company, Rachel. You're in good company. (laughs) We're told all the time by our kids that we know nothing. You know, that's what kids are. That's that's why we have our kids. (laughs) I really do know everything. (laughs) Okay. So you'd rather be amazed. I love that Mm -hmm. one. That's good. All right. Would you rather only be able to whisper or only be able to shout? Ooh. Ah, uh, oh, wow. That's a hard one. Um, I'm going to go with shout because mm. I think in what I do and yeah. in the fact that people have been silent so much, mm-hmm. I want to be able to shout, not whisper. Mm. <laughs> I love that's it. Good. I love that's it. Good. Rachel, you have just been a delight. I'm so glad to have virtually met you. Um, yeah. You're welcome back here anytime. We have so much more to talk about. Thank you for your vulnerability today and for your willingness to to spend your morning with us. We really appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, a resource courtesy of the Honestly Adoption Company. To learn more about us, visit www.honestlyadoption.com.